The Battle of Shanghai was the first of the 22 major engagements fought between the National Revolutionary Army of the Republic of China and the Imperial Japanese Army of the Empire of Japan during the Second Sino-Japanese War. It was one of the largest and bloodiest battles of the entire war, described by Peter Harmson as Stalingrad on the Yangtze. Since 1931, China and Japan had been embroiled in incessant, smaller conflicts, often known as incidents, that saw China lose territories piece by piece. The term incident was used by the Japanese Imperial High Command to play down the Japanese invasions of China. Although Japan had not formally declared war on China by August 1937, following the Marco Polo Bridge incident of July 7 and the ensuing Japanese invasion of North China, a de facto state of war existed between China and Japan. Dog Chinese resistance at Shanghai was aimed at stalling the rapid Japanese advance, giving much needed time for the Chinese government to move vital industries to the interior, while at the same time attempting to bring sympathetic Western powers to China's side. During the fierce three-month battle, Chinese and Japanese troops fought in downtown Shanghai, in the outlying towns and on the beaches of the Yangtze and the Hangzhou Bay, where the Japanese had made amphibious landings. The Chinese soldiers had to rely primarily on small-caliber weapons in the defense of Shanghai, against an overwhelming onslaught of air, naval, and armored striking power from Japan. In the end, Shanghai fell, and China lost a significant portion of its best troops, while all also failing to elicit any international intervention. The resistance of Chinese forces, however, came as a massive shock to the Japanese invaders who had been indoctrinated with notions of cultural and martial superiority, and dramatically demoralized the Japanese army. The battle can be divided into three stages, and eventually involved nearly one million troops. The first stage lasted from August 13 to August 22, 1937, during which the NRA attempt to eradicate Japanese troop presence in downtown Shanghai. The second stage lasted from August 23 to October 26, 1937, during which the Japanese launched amphibious landings at Jiangsu coast and the two armies fought a Stalingrad-type house-to-house battle, with the Japanese attempting to gain control of the city and the surrounding regions. The last stage, ranging from October 27 to the end of November 1937, involved the retreat of the Chinese army in the face of Japanese flanking maneuvers, and the ensuing combat on the road to China's capital, Nanjing. Names In Chinese, the Battle of Shanghai is known as the Battle of Songhu. Song is short for Wu Song, a strategic town in the northern suburbs of Shanghai, where the Huang Pu River flows into the Yangtze, who is the abbreviation for Shanghai. In Chinese literature, the battle is also referred to as 813, denoting August 13, the date when battle began. In some Japanese sources, the battle is known as the Second Shanghai Incident, alluding to the First Shanghai Incident of 1932. However, the 1937 Battle of Shanghai was a full-scale battle signifying the beginning of an all-out war between the two countries. Background the Battle of Shanghai was the first major battle of the Second Sino-Japanese War and escalated the skirmish of the Marco Polo Bridge incident and the localized war in North China into a full-scale war that would involve most major regions of China. There were several underlying causes for this. Strategic reasons since the outbreak of the war on July 7, 1937, most combat had occurred in and around North China in operations collectively known as the Battle of Biping Shinsine. Originally, neither China nor Japan wanted the skirmish to escalate into a full-scale war. Japan expected a quick ceasefire and further gains of Chinese territory, similar to what had happened earlier in the Mukden incident. January 28 incident, the Great Wall incident, and various other settlements brokered in the mid-1930s. 
Generalissimo Tian Kai-shek saw the Marco Polo Bridge incident as the boldest attempt yet by Japan to completely separate northern provinces from Chinese control and incorporate them into the Japanese puppet state of Manchukuo. In the wake of the second united front formed after the XIAN incident, this event broke the final point of Chiang's tolerance of Japanese aggression according to his policy of internal pacification before external resistance. Chiang decided to initiate a full-scale war with Japan. Chiang Kai-shek and his advisors believed that the next logical step for the Japanese army was to march from North China, along the piping Hankou and Shinsain Pukou railways, and cut right into Wuhan and areas of central and east China. The Japanese north to south advance meant that the Chinese army had to defend along a horizontal axis, to attempt to encircle the advancing enemy through pincer movement. However, the Chinese army was simply incapable of such maneuvers, whereas the Japanese Imperial Army had qualitative superiority in North China, and the mobility of its armor and artillery pieces was unmatched. Chinese military presence in North China was minimal, and the central government and the Kuomintang itself were banned from conducting political activity in Hebei province as a result of the Hiamezu Agreement. In addition, most of the more robust Chinese defense works were not built in North China, but in East China, along the lower Yangtze Delta. Also as important, Japanese troops were being reinforced easily from Japan, through Korea and Manchukuo, and finally to North China through efficient naval and rail transports. Chinese troop movement was severely handicapped by the lack of sufficient motorized vehicles and adequate railway lines. The vast majority of Chinese troops had reached the front line simply by marching. It took considerably longer for Chinese reinforcements from South China to reach North China than it did for the Japanese to reinforce from their home islands. This meant transferring the Chinese army to fight a war in North China was impractical. In addition, if the Japanese army had made a southward advance and invaded Wuhan and then turned eastward with a push toward eastern central China and encircled the Shanghai Nanjing region, Chinese defenders would have been chased to the sea in a scenario similar to the future Battle of Dunkirk. The Imperial Japanese Navy had total supremacy in Chinese seas and the retreating Chinese forces would have been decimated by the enemy as they had nowhere to retreat. Under this scenario, Chiang decided to establish a second front in Shanghai, with the intention of drawing enemy troops to the eastern central China theater. His plan was to force the Japanese to change the north to south direction of advance into east to west. This way, Chinese troops would have room in the southwest for them to retreat and regroup should Shanghai, Nanjing, and Wuhan fall to Japan. The Chinese plan was to fight as much as possible to delay the Japanese advance, while time was bought to move the government and vital industries into the Chinese interior. This was the basis of the strategy of trading, space for time, political causes, public opinion and patriotism were also strong factors in Chiang's decision to pursue a full-scale war with Japan. Throughout the 1930s, the central government had lost considerable public support because it was preoccupied with the pacification of Chinese communist insurrections before mounting a full-scale war against Japan. However, having emerged from the peaceful resolution of the XIAN incident, Chiang Kai-shek attained unprecedented popularity as he was seen as the only national leader capable of conducting the war against Japan. It was impossible for him to back down as it would have doomed his political career. Originally, Chiang believed that China needed at least several years of internal peace and unity to build up a national army and sufficient industries to fight Japan on the same footing. Chiang feared that a premature war would put an end to his preparatory plans, and thus opted for fighting small, localized incidents that were characteristic of Sino-Japanese conflicts in the 1930s. On the other hand, if Chiang decided to put up an all-out resistance, 
he risked losing his newly reorganized divisions that were barely ready to meet the enemy head-on. In addition to the complete destruction of China's nascent industrial base, essentially, for Tiang, fighting a full-scale war would bolster his public image among the Chinese but would undermine his political leverage, which was based on military strength, against other regional powers. However, stepping down and making more concessions would make him appear unpatriotic and lose public support, but would maintain his military power. The Battle of Shanghai and the decision for total war would prove to be a great gamble for Chiang. Chiang also could not afford losing Zhejiang and Jiangsu provinces to Japanese hands. Both Nanjing, the capital of the rock at the time, and Shanghai were situated in Jiangsu province. The two provinces were also the economic powerhouse of the lower Yangtze Delta region, and much of the industrial progress and political foundation of the Nanjing decade were developed here. The region was also the only place in China where the central government under Chiang Kai-shek had unopposed political authority. Since North China had been under Japanese influence, and other provinces were subject to the control of remnant warlords or other KMT militarist factions. Thus, Chiang also had to defend Shanghai at all costs since it was situated at the core of his political and economic administration. Shanghai was a diverse cosmopolitan city and had investments and assets from most major international powers, such as the United States, the United Kingdom, and France. Traditionally, Western powers had been unwilling to condemn Japanese aggression because of their preoccupation with the situation in Europe and Japan's anti-Soviet Union political agenda. However, a Japanese invasion of the city would provide an impetus for the West to enter the war on the side of China. It was obvious that the war would undercut Western commercial investments and make them propose a quick settlement on terms acceptable to China. In addition, Japan could not possibly sustain a war against the United States, the greatest economic power, and the United Kingdom, the greatest colonial power. However, appeasement and isolationism permeated the international community and past experience from the 1930s had made it clear that Japanese excursions would not be acted upon by the international powers, other than some ineffective condemnations from the League of Nations. Already in 1935, Chiang's German advisor, General Alexander von Falkenhausen, told him that the Nine Power Treaty was little more than a scrap of paper and that he should place no hope that the international community would come to intervene. Chiang was advised that China must be prepared to fight alone for at least two years of the war, regardless of any changes in the international situation. Past experience and preparation Chiang and his advisors were also somewhat confident in raising the stakes of the battle. Since the Chinese army had fought the Japanese to a standstill in the January 28 incident, also known as the First Shanghai Incident, in 1932, because the Shanghai Ceasefire Agreement of 1932, signed after the incident, forbade the Chinese from deploying any troops within Shanghai. The Chinese trained its police garrison, whose presence was allowed in the city, in various military tactics unusual for a police force. The planning of the defense of Shanghai was overseen by Zhang Jijong, a veteran of the 1932 incident. Since China did not possess adequate artillery and armor, Zhang Jijong believed that the Chinese army should use their numerical superiority and take the initiative, and push the Japanese into the sea before they had a chance to reinforce. In 1933, three military zones, Nanjing, Nanjing Hangzhou, and Nanjing Shanghai, were established to coordinate defenses in the Yangtze Delta. In 1934, with German military assistance, the construction of the so-called Chinese Hindenburg Line began, with a series of fortifications to facilitate defense in depth. Two such lines, the Wafu line between Suzhou and Fushan, and the Zicheng line between Waxi and Zhang Yin, were in position to protect the road to Nanjing, in case Shanghai should fall into enemy hands. 
In spring 1937, just barely months before the beginning of the Second Sino-Japanese War, the lines were finally completed. However, the necessary training of personnel to man these positions and coordinate the defense had not yet been completed when the war broke out. Japanese position Since the outbreak of war on July 7, Japan had focused on conducting military operations primarily in North China, which included provinces such as Hebei, Shanxi, and Chaha. The Japanese invasion further increased the frequency of anti-Japanese protests and boycotts the Japanese goods had serious repercussions upon Japanese trade in China. The effect was strongly felt in Shanghai because there were many Japanese commercial interests in the city. The IJN had insisted on escalating troop presence to protect both Japanese factories and citizens from a possible confrontation with the Chinese, but the IJA consistently refused to cooperate until early August. One reason for this was that the Japanese army did not wish to deploy in eastern central China, for fear that such action would create a vacuum in North China and Manchukuo, which bordered the Soviet Union. Japan saw the Soviet Union as the primary military threat on the Chinese mainland and did not want to divert attention away from North China. The Japanese army command also did not wish to deploy troops into central China because doing so might steer Japan into confrontations with other foreign powers present in the region. In addition, the Japanese Army Command had a very low opinion of Chinese fighting capability, and believed that since China had almost always been mired in the civil wars, Chiang Kai-shek would focus on national unification first and would not risk his troops against the vastly superior Japanese. In the view of the Japanese Army Command there was no need for the IJA to enter central China. Thus, Japan wished to defeat China and conclude the war as soon as possible, to avoid disrupting its plans against the Soviet Union. However, the Japanese Naval Command insisted on deploying troops in central China to destroy any Chinese troops that might be dispatched to North China, where the war was localized. Following the Oyama incident of August 9, conflict in Shanghai seemed inevitable. On August 10, Naval Commander-in-Chief Mitsu Mizai Yongna voiced his demand in a cabinet meeting. He was opposed by Army Generals Ishawara Kamji and Umezu Yoshijiro, who insisted that the Shanghai Front should be the responsibility solely of the Imperial Navy. After some negotiation, the Army Command acceded to the Navy's demand and began deploying troops to the Shanghai region on August 10. The Japanese military was confident they could overcome Chinese forces in central China within three days and end the entire war in three months. The Japanese had military garrisons within the city while Chinese military presence, aside from a small military police garrison, known as the Peace Preservation Corps, and SIM fortifications, was strictly forbidden under the January 28 incident Shanghai Ceasefire Agreement. The Japanese had many factories and warehouses in the city, and most of them were reinforced for military purposes. The Japanese Marines headquarters was near a textile mill and there were more than 80 emplacements and bunkers of various types in the city. In all, the Japanese army was well prepared to meet the numerically superior, but under-equipped and poorly trained Chinese army. Prelude to the battle, Oyama incident on August 9. Lieutenant Isao Oyama of the Japanese Marines was shot dead by Chinese Peace Preservation Corps troops stationed near Hongqiao Airport. It is still unknown whether Oyama attempted to enter the military airport. Mao Zedong biographers Jun Chang and John Halliday assert that Chinese Army General Zhang Jijong was a Communist Party sympathizer and staged the Oyama incident at Stalin's behest. Stalin, they say, wanted war in order to distract Japan from attacking the Soviet Union. Zhang, they continue, brought a condemned Chinese soldier and shot him with LT, Oyama's gun to heighten credibility. They quote Mao as saying that all-out war between Japan and China would weaken Chiang Kai-shek's government. 
giving MAOs less numerous communists an advantage. In any case, the Oyama incident heightened tensions. On August 10, the Japanese Consul General demanded that the Chinese withdraw the Peace Preservation Corps and dismantle their defense works around the city. He also made it clear that the Imperial Army regarded the shooting of the Japanese officer as humiliating, and that even the slightest further provocation could cause the situation to explode. The incident also caused Japan to send reinforcements to the Shanghai area on August 10. In response to Japanese troop movements, Chiang Kai-shek began deploying Chinese troops to the Shanghai area on August 11. Final efforts at negotiation on August 12, representatives of the major powers convened and Japan demanded the powers enforce the withdrawal of Chinese troops from Shanghai, but Mayor Yu Hangchun protested that Japan had already violated the agreement through its invasion of China on July 7. The major powers did not wish to see another January 28 incident, which greatly disrupted foreign economic activities in Shanghai. On the other hand, Chinese citizens feverishly welcomed the presence of Chinese troops in the city. In Nanjing, Chinese and Japanese representatives met for the last time for final efforts at negotiation. The Japanese demanded that the Chinese withdraw all Peace Preservation Corps from Shanghai and all regular troops from the vicinities of the city. The Chinese insisted that the Japanese demand of a unilateral Chinese withdrawal was unacceptable since the two countries were already fighting a war in North China. At last Mayor Yu made it clear that at most the Chinese government would concede that the Chinese troops would not fire unless fired upon. Japan on the other hand placed all responsibility on China because of Chinese deployment of troops around Shanghai. Negotiation was impossible and there was no alternative other than the spread of war into central China. Order of Battle